Hi, this is going to be a video on uh, using, first of all, determining how to uh, create a random line across the section and how we might make use of that, particularly with reference to determining strike and dip of fault planes. The same thing is applicable to horizons, uh, but we'll do it with fault planes here. Um, what I have here is a series of sections. The two, the two seismic sections you see are an inline and a crossline section. I have this oriented just about north-south, uh, north so we can go over and we can flip the inline on and off, and we can see that's this uh, east-west line is an inline, the cross line is a north-south line. And as we look at the fault that I've uh, uh, displayed, you can see that uh, it has, it's not all one strike and dip, I'm going to concentrate just on this portion of it and look at the strike and dip of this part of the part of the fault. So among the ways it's clear that neither one of the inline or the cross line are actually perpendicular or parallel to this fault. So what we want to do to uh, come up with a way to have a section which will be perpendicular that we will use to get at dip and that we will use uh, another line to be parallel to the section which will help us with the strike. I'm going to go up to, in this case, Teapot Dome, press the right mouse button, and I'm going to come down to the thing that says Insert Seismic Intersection. It turns out it will use, I'm going to click on that, you Insert Seismic Intersection, and a new line is going to pop up in my, in my section and I'm going to turn off the cross line and the in line and you'll note here that this random line looks just like a uh, just like a cross line at the moment however that's when it comes up you now have the ability to move this around so if you have your your uh, system set to, or to press the button for manipulate plane we can come down and if we just do this normally it will move in the same way parallel along in a direction However, if we hit the shift button, which I'm doing now, I can actually now take this and turn it and twist it to different angles. It's a kind of a peculiar, uh, with the, uh, I'm going to have to turn it so I can get at the side of it here. Get a little angle there, go back and click, and I can now move this and so I'm just about, well, I jiggled off, but just about parallel now to this. And at the moment, I'm going, to or I'm going to take this over so that I can see whether indeed it is just about aligned with the feature that I'm looking for. So I'm going to uh, change to the hand tool, and we see it's not too bad. When we're doing strike and dips on faults like this that are obviously not planar, we're, we're always going to have a little bit of trouble as to exactly what and at what point we're looking at a particular feature. So I'm going to use that as a rough approximation of the angle. And I'm going to give that random line a name, and I'm just going to call it Fault Parallel. To indicate that it's Fault Parallel, pretty obvious. Okay, I'm now going to create a second one of these line, random lines, and I'm going to set it up to be perpendicular, because I'll be able to use both of these. I'm going to come down to intersect seismic intersection. I get another random line. I'm going to turn, I'm going to leave, I'm going to turn my, uh, why do I have two here? I'm going to turn this line. Okay, let's see what we're doing. Okay, what I now want to do is construct this to be roughly perpendicular to that plane. So I'm going to again hit the uh, shift button. Oops, I need to be in the manipulate plane mode. And I can now turn this uh, I'm not doing what I want. What I want is roughly perpendicular, which is about there, and then I'm going to slide this up within the section of the fault I care about, and now I'm going to go back to the hand tool, 
and I can just look and see and see whether or not this is going to be approximately uh, approximately perpendicular to the strike of the fall. I'm not going to worry too much about the details here. We'll get the right approximate uh, answer out of this. Now that I've done that, I now want to go over to, uh, first of all, I'd like to look at the direction that which the faults are oriented. So I'm going to go, uh, let me just go ahead and give this the name uh, fault normal. Say OK. Now, I can go up here and use my interpretation window because I know it, it lines up along these and it gives us a tool that will be handy. So I'm going to click there and notice this is the inline. I don't want the inline. I want, in this case, the fault parallel random line. And I'm not too worried about what this looks like in here. What I want to use is a tool called the measure distance tool. It's the third one down over here on the right side. And I'm going to click that. And what it does for us is it's going to, as I click somewhere on this section, you'll note there's a, a rubber band line there. It's a little hard to see. I can just go to another place and then let it just sit there. And if you notice down in the lower right hand corner, there is in the very bottom, very corner, you have something called heading. And that's going to represent the azimuth or the compass direction uh, of the of the particular uh, uh, line along which this line goes. So that is telling us right away that if we've lined our our uh, random line over the fault approximately, then we are going to get that is going to be our strike. So we have a strike of about thirty degrees. We'll look back at it in a little bit and see if that looks right. But that's uh, basically right. I can actually click two different places, any two different places on this section, and I will either get, um, let's go back that way, I'll even get minus 149.7, which is exactly 180 degrees from the other direction that I'm moving, which is left to right, and then I get 30.3. So either of those works as a, uh, as a descriptor of the strike. So that's a way to get at the strike. Now I'm going to go to the fault normal window, and I'm going to get away for at the moment from the, uh, from the tool, the distance tool. Now I have my fault, and I have some clear features that I can pick. And if I would like to know the dip of this, I need to know two things. One, I need to, well, first of all, I need to pick two points along this fault. So I'm going to pick a point somewhere here where the hand is showing and somewhere down here, and we're going to try to get a dip of that. Now, the one thing we have to think about is that everything is measured in distance units horizontally, so it's in U.S. feet units, but vertically we are in two-way travel time. So when we think of the idea of a dip, we have to be a little careful. And one way to express dip in seismic data is in terms of milliseconds per foot. So in other words, how many milliseconds, if we have a straight line, how many milliseconds does it change as we change for one foot unit horizontally? And this is, so it will not come out in a unit like degrees, but it will come out as a slope in terms of milliseconds per, per foot. So we can directly get that information, again, using our distance measure tool. I'm going to go up and click it. And I'm going to pick a, pick a point right up here that looks to me like it's on the fault. And I'm going to string this down to a fault there. And I'm not going to push anything because this has the odd characteristic that it then loses the information. So now we're going to look, and I can't point to it, but down in the right side, right bottom, we're going to see a couple things that help us. We're not so much worried about the heading here, but we are interested in the time difference. So it says time minus 376 point, some decimal places, in milliseconds. So that represents the time from the part of the fault that I'm just measuring. So that's the vertical component in milliseconds. And you can actually eyeball this and look over and see that it, it actually looks like the uh, 376 or so 
milliseconds is a good measurement. The second thing you want to look at is the box that says 2D and then a colon 513.879 US feet. And that represents the horizontal distance between these two traces. So this gives you, in, it's in the direction in which the um, perpendicular to the dipping fault. So we're getting, we're getting a good representation here of the slope of the fault. So the numbers you will need, these are the two you will want to take down, and that is the 2D distance and the vertical time difference. In the, for the assignment, you will want to use those two numbers to come up with a slope in the dip direction of, approx of based on the uh, number of milliseconds over the number of feet to get that angle. Now, you are also going to be asked, what if you knew the velocity of this particular rock within the area of the fault? And I'd like you to also use that number to come up with an actual angular dip, much as a geologist would use for this fault. For that, you will need to develop a relationship between the number of vertical uh, two-way travel time milliseconds and to turn that into a distance vertically along the fault. And then you can actually obtain a, uh, an actual angular dip for this feature. And I'm not going to go through doing that, but I'd like you to pick up those numbers. So Petrel will give you a handy way to make some measurements that you will then be able to use in the course of determining strikes and dips of features. And we will use that with both uh, uh, faults and also horizons at particular places. Thank you.